No guns. Don't you, you leave your guns at home, okay? What? Last time Natalie won and she forgot. <laughs> That's not how I That's awful for two. Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm playing. What's your name again? I'm just kidding, Ava. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, you guys ready? Here. What? A little bit. Your name is Little Bit. That's what I'm going to call you from now on. Little Bit. Little Bit. That's Little Bit over there. Uh, Ashley. Amber. Amber. Okay, that's enough. All right, here we go. In three, two, one. You guys ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Who's got paper? Everybody with paper, sit down. Sit down. If you got paper, sit down. Sit down. Here we go. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Scissors. Anybody? Scissors, scissors, scissors. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. All of you, paper, sit yourself down. Okay, here we go. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh, dang it. Okay. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh. Oh, a lot of y'all all at once. You got scissors over there? Oh, Damien. Ooh, wee. Here we go. You can stay standing, Angel. Come on, stay standing. Here we go. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh, oh, got him. Wow, got them all in one shot. That was fantastic. Listen, I just have a couple of announcements. Um, I have the worship team come on up. That includes me, which should be really interesting here. Uh, I'm going to make my announcements from over here. Uh, we just have a few things going on. So how many of you ladies had an opportunity last uh, weekend to go to their four? Anybody go to their four? My piano. Do you have an amazing time? It was it was an amazing, they can't see him on camera. That's all right. They probably can't even see me because I'm way over here. Um, but therefore happened last weekend. But ladies, gentlemen, if you have not registered for camp, what are you waiting for? Get your button here. Get on and register for camp. Listen, guys, <coughs> camp is going to be amazing this year. Uh, we're going to go for a week two. Yeah. And that, that week, we're going to have Peter Reeves. Y'all seen how, they, how I did that? It was like smooth OG, switching <laughs> up on him. Y'all don't even know what I just did. Switched on the mics. But we're going to have Peter Reeves that is going to be speaking at uh, youth camp uh, the week that we go. I encourage you guys to go. It's going to be an amazing time. <clears throat> um, and then don't forget, next Wednesday, next Wednesday, I'll be preaching. Um, but tonight... Our very own Patrick will be sharing Woo! the word with you guys. Yes, sir. <laughs> Excited about that. Um, but uh, next week, don't forget, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you guys a question, and that's what would you like the summer to look like? Uh, so that means, like, do you guys, guys want to come? Do you want to hang out every other week, every week, whatever, blah, 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 all that good stuff. But be ready to answer that question because we want to spend time with you guys over the summer. We don't want you guys to, yep. to be abandoned. We don't want to leave you as orphans. We don't. You know, that's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. If you didn't know. So uh, we're going to get ready for worship. Why don't you guys come on up? Yeah. I'm going to open us in prayer, and then we're going to hop right into worship, and then Patrick is going to bring the word, and I'm excited about what he has to say. I've, I've had the privilege stand. of listening all day to Patrick practicing and rehearsing and, and really praying and seeking God's face uh, for what God would want you guys to hear tonight. So, Father, we thank you. Uh, God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for all that you're doing. Lord, we ask that you would be with us. God, that your, your presence would be felt in this place. Lord, let us not be here for our, own, uh, for our own pleasure or for our own glory, but God, let us be here to bring you glory. And Father, more than anything else, let us be here to hear from you. Lord, we thank you and we love you. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together? Come on.
shit If he did it before, he can do it again So I trust it with what comes next Cause my heart's out says I can count The shadows can't deny Your name cannot be overcome Your name is alive forever lifted high Your name cannot 
Thank you for tonight, Lord Jesus, for just showing us that in the midst of all this darkness in our lives, in the world, Lord Jesus, that you make that darkness tremble, God, that you are our light, you are our peace, Lord Jesus. I pray for every student that walked through the doors tonight, Lord Jesus, that every student that is going through something right now, that it just seems impossible to overcome, seems impossible to get through, Lord Jesus, but I, I pray that you would just show them that you are the light at the end of the tunnel, Lord God. Lord Jesus, that, that you are there to just wrap your arms around them, Lord Jesus. God, I pray for the message tonight, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to just hear from you and to just be with you tonight and rest in you. We pray all this in your name. Amen. All right, you guys can head back to your seats. Thank you, worship team. They did amazing. And we are going to hear from our very own Patrick Hoffman. Once I get untangled. Sorry. Freaking web. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so while Patrick is getting untangled, uh, how are you guys doing? So I'm going to ask you guys a, just a real quick question. How many of you came here expecting to hear a message um, and actually expecting to meet with God? Because here's what I know to be true. Anytime that we go to a church service, whether it be youth group or a Sunday service, we should always, 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 always come with a heart ready to receive from him. Uh, and, and it's great to come and see your friends and do all that stuff. But uh, I'm just going to pray over Patrick real quick. Uh, this is kind of spur of the moment. Um, but I really do I really do believe that he's got a word for you guys. And I, and I hope that you guys will uh, just allow yourself to be vulnerable for a moment. Just, just for a moment, right? This isn't this isn't uh, a normal thing that we do, but just give me one second. Indulge me for a second. So, Father, I thank you for my brother. God, I thank you for Patrick and the word that you have laid on his heart. God, I pray that for every student that is in this place, God, that, Lord, that you would meet with them here. God, that this would not be, um, God, this would not just be another night where we get to hang out with our friends and uh, hopefully get something out of what was said. But, Father, that our hearts would be open and malleable, that we would be um, that we would be clay in the potter's hands. And so, God, we just thank you for all that you're doing, and uh, we just give you our, our time and attention. In Jesus' name, amen. Patrick Hoffman. Amen. I'm going to take this off because it got real hot up here. I'm a big guy, and I get sweaty, so sorry about that. So who is ready for the word tonight? Hey, I want some, I want some crowd participation. I don't want everyone to be sleeping on me. I love it. So, okay, like they were saying, if you don't know me, I'm Patrick Hoffman. I'm the worship leader at Reach here, or I'm your worship leader here. I am the son of Sue and Dennis Hoffman. 
Um, I am the brother of Casey, Stacy, and Emily Hoffman. I have the biggest blessing in the world to be engaged to be the future husband of Jordan Marie Marshall. Um, I am a musician. Sometimes I get to be a artist when I have the time to actually sit down and do it. Um, but most importantly, I am redeemed and transformed, forever changed by the relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. I am my father's child. I am able to have this relationship with Jesus, and that is who I am. And I will be forever changed because of that. And so tonight, I'm going to talk to you guys. Um, I'm going to be getting into some of my story, um, my past struggles, things that I struggle with now even, um, some of the things um, that I had going on growing up, and then also who God is and who God says we are. And before it, I'm going to pray because that always puts my nerves to rest. Um, but Father, we just come, God, expect an open-handed Lord, humble enough to say, God, whatever you want to say tonight, God, will you do it? Every word on my mouth, would it be straight from you, Lord? We don't want my good intentions, God, we want God intentions. We want you in this place, we want your truth. God, we stand in surrender and a humbleness saying, Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand whatever you want to speak to us tonight, whatever thing you want to get into, any messy area in our lives that we're trying to hide or we want to try and keep from you, Lord, we put it open in front of you today. God, we just want to hear from your word, God, of who you are, God, who you say we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, come on. When we pray, we all say amen. So in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. There we go. So, I am the youngest. I have three sisters that are older than me. We're kind of outnumbered at our house, me and my dad. We have four girls in the house. I was the youngest, and my age gap with my oldest sister is 10 years. My next youngest sister is five years. And so by, just by circumstance, I kind of was off on my own. I always felt kind of like an outsider. I didn't really have, you know, like the best friend, sibling growing up type of thing. It was just I was kind of on my own. And beyond that, um, my dad was always working. He would, he would go to work. He worked 12-hour days all the time. And so he worked like 6 to 6 every single day. Um, and then he'd get home and he was tired and dealing with his own life things and all that stuff. And so... By circumstance, I just really didn't feel wanted much. It was just kind of like I was on my own. I did my own thing. Um, even in, throughout elementary school and stuff, didn't really have a ton of friends. I was a chubby kid. Um, and so I got picked on a lot. Um, and I had a lot of anger issues and stuff because of it and all that. And realizing that I was just frustrated about everything. I actually ended up beating up a kid about it. And I'm sorry if you are watching this. That is my sincere apology. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but I had a lot of things I was dealing with, a lot of things I was struggling with. I was not, I'm not a perfect person at all. Um, I had things spoken over me when I was younger by my dad who at the kitchen table, I'd grab a lot of food and he'd say, what are you, fat? You're a pig. You're this, that, and the other thing. I had things spoken over me by him when I was trying to do homework. And anyone who can do math in this place, Lord, I thank you for them. Um, <laughs> You do math, I'll do music, and we'll be good because I am suck at math. It's just terrible. It's bad. It's really bad, guys. Um, but stuff spoke over me like, what are you, stupid? This, isn't, this is so easy. What are you, dumb? Like, why can't you just get this? And those were things that stuck with me that I still even deal with now, as you can imagine it, uh, you know, as your worship leader, as trying to like find my worth and, and questioning who I am. And I dealt with that through elementary school, just thinking and middle school and high school. And even now thinking like all the time being like, oh, I'm so fat. I'm just like, who would ever love this? Like, this is disgusting. Like where, who is even, who would even look at me? Like my intelligence of like, I don't know anything. Like this is like, I'm just so dumb. I don't know any. I don't know anything. I don't, I don't have a degree. I don't have all these other things. I don't have all these credentials to, um, for all this stuff that everyone else does and all these things and struggle with these identity issues and these, these self-worth issues. And when I went into high school, well, when I went into middle school, I started self-harming. I started cutting myself. I was just so numb and I just wanted any sort of feeling. 
I remember going into high school and stuff and kind of getting a group of friends and getting surrounded by people and they poured good intentions into me. Like they had a good vibe, we had fun and stuff. But if you know Jesus, you know that good intentions are just that. I had a, a um, teacher once say that good intentions pave the pathway to hell. They're, they're great. But I don't want to give you good intentions. I want to give you God intentions. I don't want you to just have my good vibes. I want you to have Jesus because he's the one who transforms us, renews us, brings us peace um, and all that. And so I was going through high school and stuff. And, and because I had this friend group and stuff, when they would move away and, and even during it, like I wasn't getting healing. I wasn't getting peace. I wasn't doing all that stuff. We would numb the pain. I'd smoke weed. I'd do all that stuff. We'd drink. We'd do. No, I was searching after a relationship. If it wasn't one thing, it was another thing. I just wanted to be wanted by somebody. I just wanted, you know, all these things. These um, wanted to be a part of, like, all my buddies were having all these sexual encounters and things like that, and I was like, um, getting wrapped up in it or, or finding my worth in things that I shouldn't be looking at on the internet and all this stuff of trying to and being angry and just like beating walls. Like that's who I was. I was a bro I'm a broken person, no different than anybody else. So I hope tonight we can all kind of like sit on the same playing field of like, we're all pretty messed up. Maybe you're like, eh, I ain't as messed up as you. But <laughs> that's okay. I'm pretty messed up. But I got Jesus, so I'm good. And so I dealt with all those things and I ended up um giving my heart to the Lord my senior year of high school in the season of depression, the season of, um, of self-harm and, and I was suicidal and stuff and ended up going and um, going to youth group and ended up feeling the presence of the Lord and giving my heart to him and started seeking him and stuff. And even past that, I was still struggling and stuff. And I dealt with so many different identity issues, so many worth issues. And I bring all that up tonight because we're gonna hop into a part of scripture where I think a lot of us, in whatever way, shape, or form, have struggled with some sort of self-worth, some sort of identity crisis, and some sort of identity attack. And that's the title of my message tonight, is Identity Attack. That if we had this all going on, I was dealing with it, you guys are dealing with this. But this is not a new thing. I'm going to tell you that right up. This was literally here, this attack on on us as people, as children of God, as humanity in general, was literally there in the beginning. And we're going to hop into that verse where it says, in the beginning, you know. But literally was there from the beginning. And so we're going to hop into scripture. I'm going to reference a lot of different things. So I want you guys to actually do something that's outside your comfort zone. I know you all have phones. I don't want you to go on social media, but I want you to pull out your notepad, and I want you to take notes. Because it's always great to hear a message. That's awesome. Sweet. I hear a message and stuff. But then when I get home, I'm like, I don't remember what the heck he was saying. Or you feel like God was speaking something to you and you didn't write it down. And then you're like, eh, whatever. It was probably all made up in my head. Eh, sometimes it's not all made up in your head. Jesus talks to you sometimes. Actually, a lot of times. So we just kind of got to pause for a moment and listen. But I want you to take notes. I'm going to hit a lot of different scripture references I'm not going to get into every single one, but I'll reference them so you can write them down. I want you guys to be proactive in your own relationship with Christ. I don't want this to be the only time you get Jesus. I want you to be able to, to research on your own. I want you to be able to get into the word because one day you're not going to be in this youth group. You're not going to have me. You're not going to have Kevin. You're not going to have leaders who are pouring into you, leading you in worship, leading you in prayer, giving you the message. You're not going to have us doing that but Jesus is always going to be there. And he's always accessible to all of us. And so I want to be able to have you guys start learning now and training in that now of like, oh, I can go talk to Jesus. I can go see in his word where he says this and research this and stuff. I don't need a big old PhD to understand what God's speaking to me because I can pray and be led by his Holy Spirit. So we're going to get into it. But, so, we're going to, Look here in, where did my notes go? There they are. That's the one. Sorry about that. That's awkward. I feel silly. <laughs> so we know in the beginning we're going to hop 
all the way back even before creation was born. We know that from Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 that Lucifer was an angel in heaven. He was then cast out of heaven because he led a rebellion against God. There was pride found in his heart, and he ended up throwing this rebellion against God, trying to overthrow him, take his power, and he ended up getting casted out of heaven. And so his kind of agenda, as we know, the lion prowls around to seek, kill, and destroy And that he is trying to stop what God is doing, trying to overthrow him and stop whatever God has for us and deter us from whatever the Lord has for us. And so Lucifer gets kicked out of heaven, okay? And then later on, we find, as recorded in Genesis 1 and 2, that God creates the world. He speaks the world into existence. He speaks and the land... You know, the land form, the waters, the animals, the light. He said, let there be light, and there was light, all that stuff, and he made mankind, okay? He ended up breathing into the dust, and it formed man, and he created mankind. And we get to Genesis 3, where then the serpent appears, okay? And the serpent's there, and the serpent is Lucifer, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him, okay? And so he's there. In the garden. He comes in the garden. So after God made mankind, they were in the garden. They were having a relationship with God and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, the serpent comes. And the serpent comes along and sees the female. And you guys really should read your Bibles. Maybe I was the only one who didn't know this. But when God created mankind, he created them male and female. And he called them Adam. Adam is the Hebrew word for mankind. Okay? There was no Eve yet. That didn't happen until later in the story. So we'll get to that when we get there. But so they were in the garden. They were having a relationship with God. They had this unity. There wasn't any separation between them. Male and female, they were together. They were having a relationship with God. And it was perfect. They, had no, they, had, they were spotless. They were holy. They were in his presence because we know that nothing that isn't holy can be in God's presence except for the redemptive power of Jesus. Amen? There we go. And so... We go and we look at it, and all of a sudden, this, um, the serpent comes and starts talking to Eve. And he doesn't offer her, so Satan comes and is, is trying to deter us from what God has for us and overthrow God. He doesn't offer her money. He doesn't offer her power. He doesn't offer her all of these things. He doesn't offer them any of that. We see for the first time what Satan's kind of attack against humanity is. The same attack that he does over and over after every single generation. He doesn't, as you learn, he doesn't really have many tricks. But he'll get you with this one. And that he attacks identity. We see this conversation that they're having in Genesis 3, 1 through 5. And the serpent comes to to the female and says, did God really say that you shouldn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Or eat from any tree in the garden. He always twists the word a little bit. And then she says, no, he said that we shouldn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because we will certainly die. And so before this, they're in the garden and stuff. I'm going to summarize this. Um, I'm not going to skip over it because I've learned that not everybody knows all of this history and stuff in the context of it. Um, And so they're in the garden and stuff, and God tells them, you can eat from any tree here. It's lush, it's great and stuff, you can eat from any tree here, but do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because you will certainly die. Okay, that's what he tells them. Nothing else. They have relationship, they live together and stuff. And the serpent comes and he asks that, and he says, did God really say this? And then he asks, and then he says, certainly you will not die, which is a really bold thing coming from right after God says, You will certainly die if you do this. And Satan's like, oh, no, you won't. And it's like, whatever, dude. (laughs) And then he says, for God knows that if you eat from this tree, you will become like God. So right here, we see the, the two things of identity attack that he does. He attacks God's identity by saying, did God really say that? And we know that he attacks God's identity there because God, it says in John 1, 1, that the word was, or in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, or the word was God and the word was with God. So if you attack God's word, you attack the validity of his being. 
in general. And so he says, is God really who he says he is? Did God really say that? And then he attacks their identity by saying, for God knows that if you eat from that, that you'll be just like God. Like, oh, he knows that he's, he's keeping something from you, and you'll be just like God. But I'm going to argue that, and as scripture kind of proves, he, they already were like God. And so I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But they're there in the garden and stuff, and they ended up eating from the, the tree. And it says that the woman had seen the fruit and saw that it was good. And uh, let me see. You'll certainly die and knows that you eat from it. The eyes will be open. And can we go to Genesis 3, 7 real quick? Um, yeah. Saw the fruit was pleasing to the eye. Oh, go back to the other one. Sorry. The one before it. There you go. Woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for fruit and pleasing to the eye. And sometimes I'm going to hit on that real quick. Is that sometimes we can't trust what our eyes are saying. We can't trust what our feelings are saying. They're like the wind. They flow back and forth. But truth is truth is truth. When they were in this moment, the enemy was saying, did God really say this? Did he really say this? He was trying to deter them from what God's word was because truth is truth is truth is truth. No matter our feelings, no matter our situation, God is who he says he is. And so... We know that in these situations, whenever we're like, this doesn't look like what God says, or we feel this thing, and it's not what God's word says, we can bring those feelings up against truth and say, oh, that's, nope, that ain't it. And so I can live differently from this. Well, that ain't it. I know what God says. But he attacks their identity. He attacks God's identity, and he attacks their identity. And we know that he attacks their identity because they, he says, Oh, well, you will be just like God. Well, in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and in Genesis 5, 1, he says that they, he made them in his image, male and female. And then in Genesis 1, 3, or 1, 31, he said on the sixth day when he got done creating everything, that it was very good. That he didn't make a mistake. They were, they were holy. They were perfect. That they were already like God. And so really what the enemy is saying here and kind of summarizing it up, he says, God is not who he says he is, and you are not who God says you are. And how many times do we get into situations, we have times in our lives where we're like, oh, I don't feel like a royal priesthood or a city on a hill. I don't feel like an overcomer in Jesus. I don't feel like this, that, or the other thing. I don't feel like not looking away from social media. Now I'll let them do their thing. But, so, I don't, feel, I don't feel like in this situation, this is what God is really, like, this is true for me. I, I haven't felt your peace beyond all their understanding. I don't, I don't see you actually moving in this moment like you say you are. And that's the enemy trying to come in and be like, deter you from those things. Then we can go to truth and say, oh, this is what is really going on. In Genesis 3, 7, it says that they realized that they were naked and that they were ashamed and they hid. And guys, this is youth group, so I know some of you guys are going to be like, <laughs> whatever. But this is the truth. This is in your Bibles. You need to read your Bibles, guys. They were naked this whole entire time. The whole entire time. From the moment they were created, he created them male and female and said it was very good, and they were naked. They didn't have any, you know, American Eagle jeans on or some vans or whatever. They were naked. And then when they ate from the tree of good and evil, then it says that they were ashamed and they hid. Before, they were content with the, the way God created them to be, and then now they are ashamed and they hid. Do we ever look at ourselves and our past, our regrets, the things that we do, the things that we struggle with, the things that people have spoken over us, and be ashamed and hide? Do we ever do that? Can anybody be honest in church? I do that. I run all the time. I get all anxious and stuff and, and depressed, and I hide in a hole. I get insecure about stuff and feel like I don't look good. I will literally go home. If I think I look fat, 
I will go home and change. Not even kidding. I'm just being honest in church. I feel like we should be that sometimes, all the time. Um, but do we do the same thing that Adam, the male and female, do in this moment? They hid. They were ashamed, and they hid. What do we hide from, and what do we hide in? Do we hide in our social medias? Do we hide in our relationships? Do we hide in our performing? Do we hide in our music? Do we hide in fill in the blank, whatever it is? What are we hiding in? Because that's not what God wants for us. He doesn't want us to hide and be ashamed of who he's called us to be and who he is. Sometimes we get it twisted and we don't really know who we are and we're gonna get into that here further. And so they hid. And in Genesis 3, 9 through 11, God asks this question. He says, where are you? And God knows everything. It's funny to look at scripture and be like, whenever God or Jesus asks a question, he knows everything. He knows everything. He's beyond space and time and everything. He knows all the stuff going on. So he asks them right then, he says, where are you? And the male said, I heard and I was afraid. I was naked and so I hid. I heard you were coming. I was afraid. I realized I was naked and I hid. In God, in God fashion, of how good he is, does not do what I would do, which I would totally be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Did I not tell you? Did I not, did I not tell you to not eat from that tree? Didn't I say the only thing that you need to do is not eat from this tree? You can have everything else, but don't eat from that tree. Don't you know that because you ate from that tree, that sickness and death now is in the world? Don't you know that because you ate from that tree, that people are going to suffer through pain, that people are going to be enslaved in slavery over pride and things, people are going to be discriminated against, people are going to be broken down and beaten, people are going to suffer with diseases and cancer and things like that. People are going to be in sex trafficking and, and enslaved. Don't you know that, that you just did that? He doesn't do that. I would do that. I'd be ticked. As you can just kind of see. Don't you know? That that's what you just did. He didn't do any of that. The first thing that came out of his mouth was, where are you? It does say later that he asks, did you do the thing I told you not to do? It doesn't say that he yelled. It doesn't say that he just was like, wah. But it says, where are you? His first concern was for them. His first concern was where are they? And then the next question he asked is, after he said, I heard you, I was afraid, I was naked, realizing he was naked, and I hid from you. He says, who told you you were naked? Because before, you were naked, but you didn't have a problem with it. You didn't have a problem with the way that I created you to be, but now you do. Who told you that you are anything but what I created you to be. Who told you that you were naked? His first concern was, why are you listening to anybody else but me and what your worth is? Why are you believing any lie that isn't from me? Because I didn't speak that over you. I didn't say that. I didn't say that to you. Don't you dare listen to the lies of the enemy when he says that you aren't who he says, who God says you are. Another part of scripture in Matthew 3.13 we're going to get into. The enemy does the same exact thing. And this time, it's Jesus. We all know Jesus. We can clap for Jesus, right? Hey, there we go. So, Jesus is about to get baptized, okay, guys? He's at the Jordan River. John the Baptist is there. His cousin is like, we're going to baptize you. And he's like, woohoo. Okay. That's how that happened. And when he comes out of the water in Matthew 3, 17, an audible voice from heaven 
says like a dove came down and like an audible voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. God speaks this over Jesus in that moment. He speaks this over him. You are my son whom I love, whom I'm well pleased. And guys, do you know that this was before Jesus did any healings, before he did any ministry, before he did any work, before he did anything for God, before he died on a cross and paid the ransom for the relationship that we have with him, paid the price of sin. God said, this is my son whom I love and with whom I'm well pleased. Before he did anything, he says this over him. And in the next chapter in Matthew 4, who comes up on the scene? Satan. He's like, oh, hey, how's it going? Jesus ends up going out in the wilderness. He's led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. He fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. And during that time, Satan comes and starts doing the same thing he did to Adam and Eve. He starts attacking his identity. He goes, if you really are the son of God, you will do this. If you really are the son of God, you will do this. Won't God save you? Throw yourself down from here. And he starts tempting him in different ways. And Jesus is like, I ain't getting twisted. I know what God says. I know who God is. I know who I am. Don't tempt God. And he tempts him a couple times here. And he starts attacking his identity. Again, the same thing that he did before. The same thing that we know he does now in our lives all the time. He's attacking who God is and who God says we are. But God's first words to his son are, this is my son whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. That he already told him who he is. God's first words to his son were not vocational. They didn't say, oh, become this. They weren't directional. Oh, go there, go, go to this city, go to this country. They weren't professional. They weren't saying, you need, go learn this and go, go absorb all this knowledge. They weren't instructional. They weren't, go do this thing. The first words he said to his son were, this is my son whom I'm well pleased and whom I love. They were relational. They were saying who he is. And so when he went out into the wilderness, when the enemy came against him again with the lies that Adam and Eve before him ended up believing and falling in and taking their identity from somebody else than God, he then said, no, I know who I am. Literally a voice, an audible voice, God said, like spoke to them. When he came up from the water, this is my son whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. He knew who he was. It was the same thing that happened in the garden with Adam and Eve. It was the same thing with Jesus in the wilderness. It's the same thing in our lives. The enemy comes and he attacks our identity. And your identity is not what you do. It's not how people perceive you. It's not even how you fake it. I'm about to break a bunch of people's bubbles, but your identity is not your social media accounts. Your identity is not how people perceive you or how you put on the show. Your identity isn't even of who you are. Your identity is in who you belong to. And that's a firm foundation because we know that what you do, who you are, how people perceive you, and what you pretend to be can all change. They fade like the wind. They're just like feelings. They go this way. They go that way. Everything. But your identity in Christ and who Jesus is and who he says you are never changes. Because we know in Hebrews 13, 8, that he says he's the same yesterday as he will be today and he will be forever. That his love never changes for us. And so what he says over us and speaks over us never changes. No matter what we do, no matter who we are, no matter how people perceive us or we pretend to be, no matter what your regrets or your shames or your things that you went through, no matter what you chose to do or how you treated a person, no matter what you chose to do in that relationship or what you looked at on the internet or what you were doing there that made you feel shameful or broken, no matter what people have even spoken over you and maybe somebody else ate from the tree and it hurt you, not, not what your father or your mother has spoken over to you, not what an uncle has spoken over you when he was drunk, not any of those things are who you are. That's not who you are. 
That's not who you claimed are to be. You are a child of God. You're loved by him. And so my big so what of the night is why do, Patrick, why the heck do you bring any of this up? Why are you wasting my time? Why are you being all weird? So what? So what? Why bring up the whole entire thing of Adam and Eve in the garden and, and Jesus being tempted? Why our identity and stuff? Why even bring it up? The so what of tonight is as a child of God, we respond differently to identity attacks. Whenever someone comes up to us and speaks something over us, whenever we have this feeling, whenever we feel like we aren't anything that God says we are, we can react to it differently. That's the so what. We don't react and respond as like an employee who's just doing a job. We don't react as a slave who just has to like take whatever comes to them. We don't react as a victim as like, oh, well, yeah, okay, everyone's out to get me. We don't react as a stranger who doesn't know what God speaks over us and who we are. We react as a child of God. We know who our father is. We know what he speaks over us. We know who he says we are. We know whose we are, and if we know whose we are, we know who we are. If we know who we are, if we know whose we are, we know who we are and who we are called, what we are called and who we are called to be. Because of Jesus, he doesn't see you as your mistakes, as all this stuff. That's not who you are. You're not your brokenness. You're not all that. He sees you in grace. Grace is unmerited undeserved favor. He doesn't see you as those things. He actually sees you as what we see in John 17, 23, when Jesus is praying over his people, those people who have relationship with him, us, literally us, the people down the road who are going to have a relationship with him, who are going to be disciples of Christ. He says, and he prays that God, would you help them to know that you love them the same way you love me. That you speak over them the same thing that you speak over me when I came out of that water. That I, that you say that this is my child, this is my son, this is my daughter, whom I love and whom I'm well pleased with. That before you do anything, even in spite of all the things that you've done or the things that you feel like you are or the struggles you're going through, that he says that I love you. You're my child whom I am well pleased with. That it doesn't matter about that thing you did in that relationship. It doesn't matter that way that you treated that person. It doesn't matter what someone spoke over you. Your father or your mother said something in a, in a bit of rage or whatever. That doesn't define who you are. He says, God, will you please help them to know that they love you the same way you love me? That you chose them, you love them, that you want life with them, that you're pleased with them, that you don't see them as their mistakes and their brokenness. That God sees us through the lens of Jesus who wipes all our sin away. He's saying, God, will they know that you love them the same way. And I think tonight, maybe we can all kind of be feeling this thing of God may be speaking this over us. And if not, I want to be here to say it. Who told you that you aren't anything that God told you you were? Who told you that you were worthless? Who told you that you weren't good enough? Who told you that you weren't lovable? Who told you that you should just end it all? Just kill yourself who told you that you're never gonna make it that you're just too broken that how could anybody love you who told you that because God's saying it darn well ain't me it's not me saying it I say that I love you that I chose you that's who I say you are who told you that you're anything other than because it wasn't God When I was in high school and stuff and when I was going through that season of uh, 
depression and self-harm and I was suicidal and stuff. Um, I had met the Lord already. I started my relationship with him. And it was the spring and I was walking home one day and I was going home and I had a plan and I was going to kill myself. That was it. I was sick of it. I don't want to put up with it anymore. I didn't want anything to do with it. Like I'm done. I ain't worth it. I believed every single lie that was spoken over me. Every single thing that my father said to me or my friends. Every single thing that society said I was. Every single feeling. I was just done. It's like, it ain't worth it. What's the point? I had known Jesus at that point. Okay? And I had chosen to, just like Adam and Eve, just go off and find my identity in something that isn't what truth is. But I was walking home, and <laughs> when I was in, in middle school, all that stuff, in high school, I would walk to school, bike to school every single day of the year. Okay? It didn't matter what day it was. If it was snowing, if it was raining, I have slipped on the roads in Cold Spring where I grew up hundreds of times on my bike in the middle of winter and like busted up my leg or whatever it is. I was walking home. I had, I walked him all the time. I knew him like the back of my hand. And I was walking home one day and I had my head down, hood up, headphones in, blaring music that was not pouring life into me. <laughs> um, I was walking home. And you know how it's like when you're sad, you're always just like staring down. And I was walking, I was walking. And all of a sudden I get to this one side sidewalk on a street, side street, sidewalk, whatever. And I'm walking and all of a sudden I run into this bush, okay? And I really wish I would have grabbed it before, but I didn't. But it was that time of year, which only happens like once a year for like two weeks, I feel like at most that lilacs bloom. They're like, all of a sudden, they're like dead all year round. And then all of a sudden it's like, Pff, and then they're gone. And you're like, what the crap? And I remember growing up as a kid that I would go in the back. We had lilac bushes at my house. We would go in the, I would go in the back and I'd grab them and I'd bring them inside for my mom and I'd make a bouquet because like I couldn't afford flowers, but I wanted to give her flowers and all this stuff. And I just loved them. They smelled so amazing. I, I was just so like, enthralled with I was just like this is so beautiful I love it and this bush had like overgrown over the sidewalk okay and I've never seen that happen before okay maybe I wasn't noticing it but I don't think so I never noticed it before and I was walking and I was looking down and all of a sudden I just like run into this bush because it's like overgrown on the sidewalk I'm like what the heck and I'm like oh it's this lilac bush and I'm like oh they bloomed okay cool ended up picking one of the bushel things off because they don't come in just one flower. They're in a bunch of little ones that make this whole beautiful thing, which is a whole nother thing about how God can make broken things into beautiful things and whole. But I look at this flower and I'm, I'm sitting there and I keep walking home. And like, I was, I was going home to kill myself. That was it. That was, that was the idea in my head. That was it. I'm looking at this flower and I'm walking. And I was like, man, I'd, I'd stay alive a couple extra minutes to look at this. And I'm sitting there looking at it. And it's just like, this is so beautiful. And it just like smells amazing and it's so awesome. And I've never heard God speak audibly before. But I remember just feeling like in my spirit, like God's presence, because I had felt it before. And just like his love being poured out over me. Just this like stirring thing of like, don't you see how you see this flower? Like you see this so beautiful. You find so much beauty and worth in this. I created that, but I didn't come for that. You find so much beauty in this and you say, you'll stay alive a couple minutes, extra minutes for this, but this is how I see you. 
Don't you see somewhere along the line, you got it twisted. I love you exactly the same. I love you exactly the same. I find you as and even more beautiful. It, I didn't even know this verse existed, but I felt just this thing of like, I take care of the birds of the air. I take care of the flowers of the field, but I did not die for those. I did not come to have a relationship with those things. I came for you. How much more do I love you than this flower you find so much beauty in? How much more do I love you? And I didn't even, I didn't even know that was a verse in the Bible. Like I was a brand new Christian. I didn't even know. That's in there. That's in uh, what is, Luke 12, 24 through 28. It's in Matthew and the, the two gospel accounts there. And I just felt like God pouring that over me. And obviously, I didn't end up going home and killing myself. God stepped in in such an amazing way and I'm so thankful that he did. But I am a broken person. I'm messed up, I'm flawed. But I know whose I am. Who told you you're not good enough? Who told you that you have no worth? Who told you that you're not deserving of love? Who told you you should just go end it? That's, that's it, just you're not worth anything. Who told you any of those things? because it wasn't God, because God's sitting there just saying, the only thing I speak over you is that I love you, that you are my child, that I love you, that I've chosen you, that I'm well pleased with you, that I don't see any of these things in your past and this brokenness, whatever the enemy's speaking over you, maybe your family, maybe your friends have spoken over you, that's not who you are. I say that you're beautiful. I say that I love you. And it's through Jesus that we're able to have this relationship and that our sins are wiped away, that our past mistakes, they don't define us. Through this grace, this unmerited favor, we don't need to do anything to earn it. We don't need to do anything to validate who God says we are, who we are, just in general, who we are. Not even, I'm not even gonna say who, who God says we are, because that's just fact. Truth is truth is truth is truth. Who we are. Because the enemy came in the, the gar, or in the in the wilderness to Jesus and said, if you are the son of God, do this thing. You don't need to do anything to prove yourself. Despite the things in your past, Jesus wiped that away. I don't know who's in this room who's struggling with that thing that's been spoken over them, that they're struggling with, that they think about their self-worth or their identity. But just think about that right now. Who told you that lie you're believing? Was it Jesus? Was it God? And if it isn't love, it's not him. I'm just gonna tell you right up. And that's not who you are. And I don't know who in this room needs to hear that tonight. But your heavenly father has chosen you, loves you, and is well pleased with you. That he does. And that that's unconditional love. That doesn't matter what has happened in the past. That doesn't define who you are and where your, your future is going. It's through Jesus. It's through his amazing love that we're able to have that. So I don't know who needs that today, but you don't need to do anything to start a relationship with Jesus. You don't need to be good enough. You don't need to check off the boxes. You don't need to go to youth every single Wednesday. You don't need to worship in front of everybody, praising all crazy. It says that we are able to be children of God and take this amazing gift that we're given just by expressing with our mouths that he is our Lord and Savior, that he died on a cross and he paid the price for our sins. And so I don't know who in this place, if you're wanting a relationship with Jesus, can we right now, I just wanna pray for a couple of people in this place, but can we bow our heads, close our eyes for a moment? No one looking around. And really raw, can we be humble in this place and just raw and authentic? Because I don't know who's struggling with something. I struggle with stuff with years, for years and years and years 
and just needed to ask God, would you just speak your love over me? Is there anybody in this place who's just like, I need God's truth and his love spoken over me right now? that I want God to just speak to me right now, that I have this lie in my life, maybe my family, my friends, or someone, or just this feeling of not being good enough. And I just need God to speak life and his love. I need to be able to accept that love, that he says that I have chosen you, that I love you, I'm well pleased with you, that I, Patrick, I want that to be true, but I just need, I need the faith to believe it because it's so hard in this moment. There's anybody in this place who is dealing with that? Will you raise your hand so I know who I'm pray praying with? Is there anybody in this place who is saying, I don't have a relationship with Jesus? I would love for a father to say that I love you and that I'm well pleased with you. I would love for anybody to say that you are worthy, that you are beautiful. That I, I see your brokenness, but I th literally it says that he throws our sin and our brokenness as far as the east is from the west, that I would love for someone to really love me with that kind of love that is so unconditional. And I want that relationship with Jesus. But anybody be bold enough to say, it, raise their hand and say, that, I want that. I want that relationship. I want that love in my life. I want that grace that mercy. I want to be able to accept this as Jesus who, who says, no, 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 I love you. Who, who told you those things? That isn't who you are. Let's pray together because we believe in this place that nobody prays alone. Father, would you just come into my heart right now Jesus, I accept you, Lord, as my Lord and Savior. God, I accept you as my Father in heaven. God, that you paid that price, that ransom for this relationship that we get to have. God, would you transform me? Would you renew me? Would you speak your love and your peace over me? God, I choose, Lord, your truth over the lies, over the feelings, the things that I feel, no matter how crazy the season is. God, I just want you. I just want you in all of who you are in your fullness. Lord, come into my life. Don't let me leave changed. In Jesus' name. And if anybody, whether you prayed that or not, now or later, That's a relationship that is real, that is tangible. That maybe you, you didn't pray that now, but you're saying, maybe when I'm at home tonight, that can start whenever. That's a relationship that doesn't leave you. That's a love that doesn't change because of what you do next week or what you even look at tonight. It says that we shouldn't go on doing our old life. He doesn't leave us in the crap that we're in. But that love doesn't change. And the next time you come up against some lie, something that has been spoken over you, the big so what is, we don't react to those attacks the same anymore. I know whose I am, so I know who I am, and I know who I am called. I'm a child of God, I am loved, I am worthy, It doesn't matter what I've done. He just wants my heart. Now that's a relationship you can take beyond this youth group. You can take beyond this place. That is always going to be there. He doesn't leave. He's the same yesterday as he will be today, as he will be forever. He's always faithful. So I'm just going to pray and close this out. If anybody wants prayer tonight, if anybody wants to just be prayed over, if they want to come to a leader, I'll have a couple leaders just stay in this space, be available. I'm just saying, I need, I need somebody to, to speak that over me as well. Of what God really says I am. If you would just want to spend some time with God right now, after I pray, and just seeking him, 
you can do that. But Father, we thank you for this night. God, we just thank you that every single day you don't say is mundane. You don't say, oh, I'm just going to not do anything. God, that you are intentional. You are always moving whether we see it or we feel it. Father, we thank you for this love that you give us that says that I'm going to I'm going to leave the 99 for the one. I'm going to always be speaking my love over you. I'm going to come down to earth and pay the price of sin, pay the ransom so that I can have this relationship again, so that what once was broken can be bonded together again in unity, so that I can be with my children, so that I can speak love over them, their identity over them, not the brokenness of the world to stop the attacks of the enemy who are trying to steal, steal, kill, and destroy them. No, I came to give you life to the full. That I'm moving all things for those who love me. Father, we thank you for that love, that mercy and grace that I knew every morning. Peace beyond all understanding. God, that you are moving, that you want more for us than we even want for us. God, that's why you came and we pray, Father, that you would remind us on the daily of whose we are, who we are, and who we are called. And the moments when the enemy comes, give us the strength. God, Help us to be able to dive back into your word, which truth is truth is truth, God, and see who we really are. Take those lies and put them up against truth and let the lie fall. Sometimes even just choosing the truth over the lie because feelings are like the wind. God, help us to know you every single day more and more. In your great and holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we give it up for Patrick, guys? So I don't, I don't, I don't know uh, if you guys understood fully what he was saying, but there are a lot of truths that God speaks over each and every one of you. And uh, like he said, we're going to have this space open for anybody that wants to come and. Uh, talk with the leader or even just have somebody pray with you. Maybe maybe you weren't feeling in the moment that, that it was for you to raise your hand and respond to what God is doing in and through uh, this message. Uh, so if, if you are feeling like, like God has still yet some work to do, this space will be open. But for those of you that, uh, like if your parents are here and you want to get out of here, that's all right. Thank you all for uh, those of you that joined us online. Uh, we'll see you next week, 630. Uh, don't forget, we're going to ask what you want the summer to look like. Uh, come prepared with some answers. Uh, we've got a lot of great ideas already, but we want to hear from you as well. It, it isn't just about us. This is going to be, um, you know, the things that you talk to us about, that's what's going to bring you back. So uh, with that said, you guys have a great night. If you need a leader to pray with you, we'll be up here. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you next week, 630. Thanks, guys.